Greetings, my fellow free love assignment thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful swampy mangroves of South Florida. And today's date, Friday, July 10th, 2015. Oh, yeah, just um, had to, like, get a few barrels of laughs, you know, with the whole, again, once again, the taking down of the Confederate flag. And, you know, like I said in my past episodes, is not trying to praise it or be passionate over it, but a lot of folks have different views. So, some still claim they want to resemble it as a Nazi symbol, and uh, of course, the Nazi flag. However, I tried to send, I sent that person a link about the Jews that fought for the Confederacy, and like I said, they didn't get a reply. Well, sorry to hear about that. Because one thing you always ever got to do is never jump the gun. So what I've done on Facebook, talked about the comparison with the fascists, or fascists, excuse me, that's the, how you pronounce it, fascists. And of course, I make the comparison with the Nazi symbol with the fascists, and everyone goes, oh, you got to do your homework, you've been duped, this and that, and blah, blah, blah. Like, you just start rambling off about, I, I got to do my homework on symbolism and all that, and which, to be all sincerity, I've known about this symbol long before the Mussolini, Benito Mussolini, and the Third Reich used it. It's been an ancient symbol for a good period of time. That's what, but people would have started attacking me, you know, it's like using finesse or using input, and this is why I just start laughing, you know, when people try to, like, throw this crap, you know, I'll throw you, i throw you, i you know, it's not going to fly, if I don't get mad, I get inspired, I'm like, I just start, I say, just laugh about it, I'm like, good grief, Joseph, to have an honorable discussion on these topics, will you? Instead of calling each other idiots and fools and racist, you know, it's like, have merit, for goodness sakes. However, I can't get mad, so I just take the initiative on learning about the fast keys. And um, here's some articles in here pertaining what other countries are using this particular symbol. And what does it mean? And all that, and so forth. So, we'll just start off with the Fasquis symbol from the Encyclopedia Britannica. And, and let everyone know that everything I'm going to address will be posted, footnoted, or from footnoted on my speaker page. Okay? So, uh, this is how it is. Let us begin. Fasquis, the symbol. Fasquis, plural form of Latin. Fasquis. Bundle. Bundle. In ancient Rome, insignia of official authority. It was carried by listers or attendants and was characterized by an axe, head projecting from a bundle of elm or birch, rods about five feet or one and a half meters long, and tied together with a red strap. It symbolized penal power. When carried inside Rome, the axe was removed unless the magistrate was a dictator or general celebrating a triumph as recognition of the right of a Roman citizen to appeal a magistrate's ruling. The discovery of a miniature iron set fasces in a 7th century BC as trucking tomb at Velatunia, oh, Vetulania confirmed the traditional view that Roman derived the fasces from the Ascruscans. Escrusin, Estruscan, excuse me. I pronounce these words correctly. Good grief. That's all right. The Roman emperors, beginning with Augustus in 19 BC or BCE, had 12 fasces. But after Domitian, Domitian reigned from AD or CE 81 to 96, they had 24. Dictators, 24. Councils, 12. Praetors, six. Legates, five. Priests, one. Lower Nefaskis was a form of salute to a higher official. Benito Mussolini's fascist party of Italy was named for the Fasquis, which was members adapted in 1919 as their emblem. The winged Liberty Dime, minted in the United States from 1916 to 1945, depicts the Fasquis 
on its observed side. So there's some areas in here. Of course, uh, other symbols you could be interested in. But it's like, uh, so, like I said, I've known about this, about the Fasquis, for a good period of time, long before Benito Mussolini and the Nazis ever used it. So all those ranters on Facebook tell me, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, I gotta do some homework. Sorry, you're not talking to Wally Cleaver. Eddie Haskell's not my best friend either. Okay, so play the role of warden on your own dime. However, like I said, I don't get mad, but inspired. I was laughing about this all this time, and I do digress. So, we'll hit the next page. Came from Livius.org, and part about the thing on Fasquis. And it says here, a set of rods bonded in form of a bundle, which contained an axe. In ancient Rome, the bodyguards of a magistrate carries Fasquis. The word fasquis means bundle, and it refers to the fact that it is a bundle of rods which is around it and acts in the middle. In ancient Rome, the listeners carried fasquis before council praetors and dictators, i.e. magistrates, that held imperium, which means they had the right to command and interpret the flight of the birds. Other people escort listers or and with fasquis were festal virgins, governors, and commanders of legions. During the empire, the fasces of the emperor were distinguished from those of the magistrates by laurels. This was a republican custom. However, on festive occasions, e.g. a military victory, fasces could be crowned with laurel. On the other hand, when the city was in mourning, the fasces was sometimes cloaked. More than an axe was left out. It could mean that the magistrate wanted to request something from the people or had something to apologize for. The fasces were a symbol of authority, but the precise beating is unknown. It is often claimed that the rods could be used to lash people and the axe to execute them. This may, may have been true in the days of the monarchy, but not during the Republic. After the laws of the Twelve Tables, no Roman magistrate could summarily Similarly, execute a Roman citizen. The Romans believed that the Fasces were introduced in Rome from Etruria. Again, this may be true, but the tradition is open to some criticism. So far, only one set of Fasces has been found in Etruria, in the Tumba de la Doria near Velatonia in 1890. This find has been hailed as a confirmation of the tradition, but it should be noted that the archaeologists only found a lot of small rusty flakes, which were interpreted as Etruscan fasces, which they had to admit were not identical to Roman fasces. Fasces, yeah, fasces, that's what I pronounce it. Hey, I'm, I'm learning this too, so it's pretty interesting here. They were entirely made of metal. The axe had two blades. And finally, the Etruscan fasces were extremely small. It has been that, the find of Velatonia is only a miniature model. But this is poor method to rescue an interpretation. One introduce a hypothesis. Of course, doubts about this find that did not prove that Fasquis, the Fasquis did not come from Etruria. One argument for this tradition is that the least unconvincing etymology of the word lictor is that is that is that it is derived from Etruscan word that means royal. And there's some more on here as well. Let's, let's just check this out. Let's just see here. Okay, tell you about the lictor on that particular link. So you can, just guys can check it out for yourselves. And it says here in the 18th century, the Fasquis received a second life. When the young United States and Republican France dated to use ancient Roman symbols, both were progressive revolutionary na nations that imitated the Roman Republican Constitution. The use of the Fasquis by the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini is quite another story. In 1921, he called his political movement Fasci de Combattimento, Fas Fascio, being an Italian word for peasant organizations and labor unions. When El Duce 
chose the ancient Roman Fasquis as a symbol of the fascist party. He was at the same time playing with the similarity of the words Fasquio and Fasquis. Chosen, chosen an ancient symbol and drawing a parallel between fascism and progressive movements of the past. So let's get a little bit more detailed now. All right, what the actual this symbol represents. So um, it's like I said, has this, you know has this interesting things here, and some may have some cons with it as well. But um, it's just like I say, a little broader picture, and we'll just hit this next link over here. On fast keys, which just came from whale.2 to all right and it says here on the article did you know that what a fast key is there's an article on that a fast key is a symbol from which we get the word fascism fast schism yeah fascism it was a symbol used widely in the Roman Empire and it consists of rods and bound around an axe the axe is the original of the term Axis power for the fascist countries in the Second World War. The symbolism is of people and countries bound together under a common centralized dictatorship. The axe. Not was not only was this used by ancient Rome back in the day as one of its symbol of supreme authority, but by also the original Axis power of Europe back in the first half of the 20th century, prior to during World War II. Numerous governments and other authorities have used the image of the Fasces as a symbol of power since the end of the Roman Empire. It was also had been used to hearken, hearken back to the Roman Republic, particularly by those who see themselves as modern day successors to the old Republic. Wherever you see the Fasci with a laurel wreath wrapped around it, it signifies the government using it with freely absolute reign by the people. That's interesting. The people, like the big capital the big capital letter, capital P. And that the people recognize and submit to its supreme authority over everyone and everything. So something to really think about, okay, about the fast keys. So this is, you know, I am gonna hit the ones in other areas, so I got a few more here. I got, I got, I got, I got some stuff here just to observe responsibly. That is, so I'll just give you, you know, their own little view on this whole Fasci symbol. And um, the so a symbol of control, and it signifies the government using it was freely an absolute power reigned by the people, and that the people recognize and submit to a supreme authority over everyone and everything. So who you bow down to? The supreme authority or the people. That's something really to uh you know, it's not something, something to sink in here, yeah. You know? And they have and they have they have uh, just a couple of like photos here, links here, like the religion, the uh, Knights of Columbus has a fast key and there's a sword and an anchor cross between them, between it. And of course the Romans, they have fast key in each end, and there's an eagle, okay, with the emblem or wreath or wreath around it. And of course, you have Benito Mussolini with his Fasci, and he had the two Faskis, like one left and one right, in between Benito Mussolini. And he has a few more outsides, and has the cross, S.E. Benito Mussolini, that's El Duce himself. And here's a perch eagle. Cogina Faskis was a common symbol used on the fascist uniforms. And of course, they have one here that represents the flag of a national fascist party, bearing the Faskis which was a primer symbol of Italian fascism. Then the Nazis used theirs, have a Fasquis on, it looks like, it looks like a stamp, okay? Uh, you know, the divide Reich. So um, Adolf Hitler's on there, like Benito Mussolini's right next to him for the excess of power. Had the Fasquis on one end, he had the, the, the eagle with the swastika, and the other with the rod. So, and there's a stamp here for the Italian with the, like a, la- of a female, a lady holding a Fasci in her right hand. Then you can look at a photo here of the Lincoln Memorial, Abraham Lincoln sitting on his, on his, uh, on his bench, and there's in the, in the hand, the, in the way he's laying on, is they have a Fasci at each side where he's laying his arms at. And there's another photo here in the House, U.S. House of, uh, the Chamber of Com- Congress, the House of Representatives, there's the American flag, and in between, there's a fast key on each, in between 
the national symbol of the United States of America. And of course, he had here the mace, which is a symbol of the sergeant, uh, actually the dime, okay, one of the old ancient dimes, old sickle dimes. He had the fasci right there, and of course, a couple symbols like the Ministry of Office of the United States of America. There's like a paper, a feathered pen, and the fasci right between that. And even the state of Colorado state emblem, there was like the C and I, the, illum the, illumin the illuminated eye, and uh, the fasci facing right below it, and the axe is, um, a is a facing, you could say technically facing up. And of course, uh, right here too, uh, it says the mace, which is a symbol of the office, sergeant of arms, like a mace, like a staff here, is placed at, by the sergeant of arms on a pedestal at the speaker's right each time the house convenes. The mace is also used in the British and Australian parliaments, also a Nazi symbol of power. So it's, this is like probably an old school practice, even the Third Reich has used a mace. And of course, there's a right here for the U.S. Senate, there's an emblem here, and there's a there's cross in the face of the cat of the Foskis themselves, right, right in the bottom. And of course, there's a silver dollar, which has uh, the eagle with the mace, okay, on there, one dollar, okay, and here's a one below that, too, which is uh, two large cross Foskis composing a signal of the National Guard, creating a huge X axe superimposed upon an open wing eagle. And the National Sheriff's Association has a fasquis right there with the shield, with the with the with the pentagram, the five with the stars, a star. All right, and of course, and that's a Columbus again, who directly not connected to not just the Freemasonry, but Rome through his Jesuit order. So we can say allegedly. So I'm not going to say it's right or wrong, but um, it does. A lot of, there's a lot of these um, organizations allegedly do coexist with one another. They do network allegedly. So um, I'll be very fair. And I've always observed responsibly. And of course, the bottom here, one of the U.S. National Guard logos. Okay, it says the Department of the Navy and the Air Force, and the Air Force National Guard Bureau, the American Eagle, and the uh, Foskis is crossed at, or X'd, superimposed with the Eagle's open wing. So, um, so a few, like I said, a few things that people have to really pay attention to because there's a lot of it's right in their face and they don't really recognize it. And however, with technology and people take initiative of doing their research and studying symbols, they are putting it out there, which is pretty neat. It's, and it's like I say, you, it's like, you know, not out of fear or panic, but get people to enlighten themselves a little bit more. And I'm still learning these areas as well and openly admit that. That's why I just get a big kick, you know. Like I said, I just um, get a big kick out of it. You know, just get like these little symbols here and there. It's like the swastika, for an example, it was, uh, you know, they like, said it was, in, from, it was uh, traced back in Egypt or Samaria and so forth. So, and of course, um, the, the Third Reich made that infamous. It's not called the Nazi symbol because the Nazis never created it, all right? Just to let you folks know. All right, well, let's go, uh, so we're just going to hit this next one right here online etymology dictionary they have a they have a definition for fasquis which is an is a noun and it says here the fifteen nineties from Latin fasquis a bundle of rods containing an axe with the blade projecting pearl of fasquis bundle of wood etc from proto italic fasci bundle perhaps from Pi Bashaco Bond bundle cognate Middle Irish Basque neckband Welsh bite load burden Perhaps also English beast based inner bark of the linden tree carried before a lictor, a superior Roman magistrate, as a symbol of power over life and limb. The stick symbolized punishment by whipping, the axe head execution by beheading. Hence, in Latin, it also meant figuratively high office and supreme high office and supreme power. So this came out. So something to look at as well. So you gotta look at all the pros and cons. So and um, you know, this, I'm not gonna uh, repeat myself again, but something to comprehend and just observe and take it from there. So we're gonna hit another one here, and that actually came from Westology.com. All right, the cultural insight, and it says Fasquis, an ambiv ambivalent. Bivalent symbol, and it came. This one came out October 13, 2013. All right, 
It says this. Here, it says here, in ancient Rome, those who had the power to punish criminals carried a symbol of that power for all to see. And it can still be, still be seen in many Western countries today, including the use of this, include the U.S. The symbol called fascis, fascis was a bundle of wood rods tied into an axe with strips of leather. And they have a gentleman, there's a, a portrait, a drawing of a Roman magistrate carrying the fascis. It's like glamour man, you yeah? know? How glamorous. The rods were for beatings as punishment for petty crimes and the axe for the most serious offenses. In time, the axe disappeared from the fascis carried within Rome, except in times of war. The rod ties with leather remained a symbol of authority and justice. Fascis were continuous used throughout the Roman kingdom. 750 BC, 3 BC to 509 BC, the Roman Republic, 509 BC to 27 BC, and the Roman Empire, 27 BC to 476 AD. Therein lies their ambivalence. Wow, so like it's just like like it says like right now we look at it it's like more things change more stays the same. All right, and we'll continue on here. When associated with the Republic, a bundle of rods around the axe becomes the symbol of unity and strength. One rod can easily be broken, but many together are much stronger. That's why when the United States rebelled against the British monarchy and established a republic after the War of Independence, 1776-1783, the Fasquites became part of the newly formed nation symbolism. As a result, governments building and memorials in Washington, D.C. and other cities often feature Fasquites. Here is perhaps the most famous example, the Lincoln Memorial armrest decorated with Fasquites. And of course, here's another one, House of Representatives. It had the Fasquites in between the person that's going to speak with the American flag. And of course, you got photo, you got, got a couple of knuckleheads in there, Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, like I, I go to the bathroom, I can find that more interesting. Excuse my language, but that's how I observe things in good faith. And of course, you got here, here, and here, take a look at what George Washington is leaning on the bronze copy of a Helden statue in the U.S. Capitol, Roundup. And he has a cane, looks like a cane on his right hand, and he's holding a fasquis arm on the other. So that's interesting. Of course, here, France also did the Fasquise after the 1789 revolution, and they remain such a strong symbol of the French Republic. They still adorn the French passports today. So it's like more of a European Union, the Republic of France, cease, okay? When associated with the Roman Empire, however, the act supported by the rods became a symbol of authoritarian power vested in one leader. Who decides who lives and who dies? During World War I, this appealed very much to Benito Mussolini when he decided to create a new political group to promote militarism in Italy. Mussolini chose Fasquis as an emblem of this nefarious group of individuals, which gave them their name, Fascist. Or Fasquis. Fastest. <laughs> no problem here. Naturally, the political party they founded in 1921 was called the National Fascist Party. And its ideology quickly became known as fascism. And there's an emblem for that. Now banned in Italy. Hmm, something to think about. From the symbol of Republican government, the source of the word fascism, fascist, are one of the most ambivalent symbols in the West. Fortunately, we mostly get to see their good side. So, it was cool about this particular article or link it shows you the pros and cons all right and this is how it is it is always a person that tries to quote um who is it be who uh, what the symbol is going to represent so it's mainly that particular individual or group but that's how come you gotta look at everything across the board so um this is go on here from a cool little article. Come on. Oop. From City Journal. Came out in spring of 2014. Done by Eugene Kontorovich. Kontor Kontorovich. When fascists aren't fascist. Strange history of America's federal buildings. More than 60 years ago, George Orwell observed that the word fascism has been solely wide used as a political epithet. That it 
had lost all meaning. That remains true today, as partisans across political spectrum still enjoy using the term mostly in a figurative sense to accelerate their opposition with the word so freely and easily tossed about. It, wonder, it is wonder that no one has thought to apply it. If only the provocation's sake to structures that bear actual fascist symbols, those of the United States government, no less bizarre as it seems, many federal buildings in Washington were designed promptly with fascists, the emblem of the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini's 20th century regime. Even more surprisingly, these structures were erected in the 1920s and 30s, just as Mussolini was ornamenting, ornamenting Italy's government buildings with the same symbol. 69 years after El Duce's death, Washington's public buildings remain bedecked with these symbols. Twelve large fasces, for example, adorn the Pennsylvania Side Avenue of the Department of Justice building in relief on the attic level directly above the engraving of the department's name. To best, re best relief uh, under the flagpoles at the Supreme Court done by the architect Cassidy Oprah in 1935 also featured Fasquise has one of the simple symbols of justice's two manifold attributes. Here are the Fasquise look particularly incongruous. The building's classes, classicism with this Cthulhuan columns and triangular pediment in the or, or, in this ornate Greek style, not more than pared down and the severe severe Roma style and that's just for starters and they do have it right here let's just try to I'm gonna wind this up a little bit maybe you can see it right there at the fast keys is like right above that little door there you know and so um, yeah definitely you know check that out the part as apartment of justice building and we will continue on the federal fasces have probably escaped the notice of modern observers, but their story sheds light on the often curious histories of cultural symbols. How did the fasces get there? Stranger still, how did they escape effacement during our mid-century war with the Italian fascist regime? And how should we think about them today? Fasces ornamentation had no nefarious continuation. Before Mussolini in Republican Rome, the chief magistrates were protected in public by lictors, the bodyguards who each carried the fasces, a bundle of 12 rods tied together surrounding with an outward facing axe. The lictors, lictors, or lictors, I hope I pronounced pronounce it right, use this unwieldy look scepter to chastise wrongdoers if it came to symbolize the coerced power of the council. So, like, questioning, you know, it's, it's something to think about here. The use of the fasces in public architecture across the United States was unremarkable. The fasces were a part of the standard visual vocabulary of classicism, like the lamp and the scale. They represented a particular attribute of the classical view of justice, physical power, or the ability to impose order. The American founders admired Roman republicanism, drawing from it both their pen names and many of their principles. Thus, the House of Representatives, of one of its first official acts in 1789, adapted the fasces as the emblem of a sergeant at arms. The House fasces are still visible to the Speaker's right when the full House meets in the House chamber, has 13 rods, one more than the Roman model to represent unified strength of the original American state. Yet, despite their popularity in the federal era, fasces weren't commonly modified in the 19th century architect. When he came to power in Italy in 1922, Mussolini re resurrected the symbol and employed it to represent the strength and unity of the Italian. Local fascism made physical power and the ability to impose order to its ideology. So the term fascism quickly became synonymous with authoritarian regimes. Mussolini made fasces symbols as almost common in Italy as the Nazi swastika became in Hitler's Germany. If people associate with the fasces with fascism less than they associate with the swastika with Nazism, it may simply because to El Duce's 
historical infamy pales besides Hitler as that of our World War II ally, Scotland. Fascists were craved into countless Italian public buildings and entire complex, the Littoria, Littoria was made to resemble giant style Fascists. Mussolini put the Fascists on the Italian flag, stamps, military insignia, and even manhole covers. As early as 1922, the Washington Post reports that Mussolini has ordered the coinage of money in the new design, Bernard Fascists, the emblem of ancient Rome and the new Italy regenerated by the Fascisti. So when the Fascists started popping up on major federal buildings of Washington, D.C. in the 1920s and 30s, no politically aware citizen could have been ignorant of the connotation. American architects knew Mussolini's Grandois building projects and some publicly lauded them. Cass Gilbert, who designed the Supreme Court building, met Mussolini in 1927, visit to Italy, visit to Italy to procure marble for the project. No doubt Gilbert saw the countless fascis in Italian architecture. He was favorably impressed by to El Duce, to, to El du, El Duce himself. The man chiefly responsible for the Department of Justice sculptural features, C. Paul Gen Genoine, stood there for three years at the American Academy of Rome. While there, he apparently developed a fondness for Fasquiz. Fasquiz. Yeah. He also, he also put them on the Arlington Memorial Building, completed in 1922. The Philadelphia firm overseeing the construction of the Department of Justice, finished in 1935, brought over a young artist from Italy, Roger Morigi, to do some of the sculptural work. The choice of Morigi was itself unexceptional, like unexceptional Italian. And there's a photo of the Arlington Memorial Bridge with the Fasquiz, with the where the eagle is. It looks, like, it looks like it's superimposed, it's crisscrossed, or axe, X. Ital Italian craftsmen were used, were much in vogue for federal building projects. They had more experience and better training than the American architects, as well as certain cultural cachet. But even, but given the promise of the Fasquiz in Mussolini's propaganda, Morigi must have been aware that he wasn't simply using ancient iconogra iconography. The architects working on, on the federal buildings of the 1930s were also extremely conscious of the political symbolism they employed. They often looked to the socialist realism for Europe, of Europe for inspiration. The Federal Trade Commission building, for instance, completed in 1930, is adorned with socialist realist reliefs of brawny workers engaged in various industries today. It might have been improbable that American government projects would decorate themselves with symbols of European fascism, whatever the enthusiasm of architects. But at the same, but at that time, Muslim was widely admired by Americans for getting Italy back on its feet. I'm, I'm pretty high on that bird. Hum, bird, humus rule. Rogers said of El Duce after visiting Italy and interviewing Mussolini. Dictator form of government is the greatest form of government. That is, if you have the right dictator. The rise of fascism appears to pose no direct threat to U.S. interests, and many saw it as a counterweight to scary European movements. It was Belotivism without collectivization, Nazism without racism. And, and they had this photo of Mussolini with the Fasquist between the window, is out the window. His enthusiasm for Fasquiz caused no backlash against them. The United States even became the enemy of the country. And that was from uh, Bruce Desk Archives, the Granger Collection in New York, took that photo or kept it. American leaders reflected this banging view of El Duce. In charge of the federal building programs, the Treasury Department directed of the Federal Triangle Office Construction Project, a Andrew Mellon, who served as Treasury Secretary until 1932 personally oversaw much of the planning and design for it. He was an early and durable Mussolini fan, who among other things helped the Italian regime secure favorable terms for his World War I debt. Mellon urged that, Ita the, that Italian economic policies be imported into the New Deal. Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes, was, who served as Warren G. Harding's Secretary of State, 
1921 to 1925 also supported Benito Mussolini. Having much heavy met him, you said he could not help liking the dictator. Much of the planning had some of the construction of the Federal Triangle Project, which included the Department of Justice building, occurred during the Hoover administration, 1929 to 33. In his memoirs, Hoover recalled that when he took office, Mussolini did not wor wor worry anybody much. He also expressed the view that fascist Italy would have remained relatively innocuous had not been transformed by its alliance with Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. In 1933, as the construction proceeded on the Department of Justice building, President Franklin D. Roosevelt shared his enthusiasm about Mussolini in a letter to the American ambassador in Rome, in much interest and deeply impressed by what he has accomplished by his restoring Italy and seeking to prevent general European trouble. In another letter, he praised Mussolini as an admirable Italian gentleman. That same year, FDR asked Henry Hopkins to visit Italy to look over the housing and social insurance schemes. Hmm, yet you might pick up some ideas useful to us in developing our own American plan for security. In 1939, Roosevelt looked back on his early optimism about fascist experiment. He noted that in the early 1930s, Mussolini still maintained a semblance of parliamentary government. And there were many, including myself, who hoped that having restored order and morale, he would work toward a restoration of democratic process. Interesting, could you remember this? Franklin D. Roosevelt did help create bigger forms of government. Uh, something to comprehend and do your own research on this. And it says here, Americans found Il Duce much less dulce after his invasion of Ethiopia or Abyssinia Ibe in 1935. However, the war pitted the bloated and blustery Mussolini against the handsome and charismatic emperor. Halis Selassie of Ethiopia, a noble underdog who won the hearts of many Americans. And Abyssinia was just the beginning of Mussolini's fall from favor. Then came his alliance with Hitler and finally a war with the United States. Through all of this, all this, the Fasquis remain, Fasquis remain, even as tens of thousands of Americans perished while fighting fascist troops in North Africa and Italy. The enemy's emblem continue to be displayed at the Department of Justice, Supreme, the Supreme Court, the Lincoln Memorial, and countless other Washington buildings. How the Fasci survive is a mystery. Americans are sensitive, if not hypersensitive, to any potential endorsement of an enemy's culture, language, or creed in times of war. In World War I, growers went so far to rename the humble sauerkraut, innocent of any political connotation, as Liberty Cabbage. A lone example of resistance to American Fasquis on, on anti Mussolini grounds had become an exception that proved the rule. Giants, I mean, Chicago's Grand Park Monument to Italian aviator and fascist stalwart Italo Balbo is prominent emblazoned with Fasquis. El Duce himself had donated to it, it to the city in 1934 to honor his Fort Air Force Marshal who had flown a squadron to Chicago for the World's Fair the year before. The city also renamed 7th Street as Balbo Drive. The monument is dated the 11th year of the fascist era, making the connection between the symbol and the movement explicit. In 1946, some Chicago Elderman tribe without success removed the memorial and renamed the Eponymous Street. As for the Fasquis on federal architecture, they appear not to have attracted any controversy or even notice in recent memory. The Department of Justice has published several pamphlets about its building. The only only the most recent, a brochure published in celebration of the building's 50th anniversary, mentions all the Fasquis at all and then only passing the traditional emblems of authority. Disputes about forgotten, now potentially offensive public symbols often arise during periods of restoration and repair. Yet even at this score, the Fasquis have managed to fly under the radar.
the decorative fasces on the gate of Andrew D. Mellon Auditorium on Constitution Avenue, for example, still stand out from the rest of the building thanks to the black bold, black and gold paint job they perceived in anticipation of the 1990, 1999 NATO summit. Two years earlier, New Jersey spent tens of thousands of dollars repainting the Fasquise inside the rounded Rautuna of Trenton's late 19th century capital dome. No one objected to the symbols or their continuation. The indifference continues, ironically, in an era of campaigns and lawsuits targeting everything from Indian themed sports teams and school mascots to displays of Confederate flags and religious symbols in the public square. The Fasquise has survived not just the Second World War, but also thus far the culture wars. Perhaps your quiet persistence suggests that we need not always take offense at it or to seek purge public symbols of outmoded or discredited political ideas. Such symbols may even hear the value of us today as historical reminders, less than in humility, carved in stone. That was really a good article from this gentleman, Mr. Kontorovic. He's looking at all everything, and he said it right about symbolism and taking down the flags, especially. Look what's happening today. About the Indian nicknames, the Confederate flags being taken down, religious symbolism in public square they find offensive, but how come they're not asked questioning the Fasquis? So this is why you have to always look at the bigger picture and of course like I said before I studied this long time so um, it's pretty pretty neat <laughs> but I gotta give Mr. Eugene Conovoric credit and I'll do one more here and this came from Languedoc-France.info and it says here, living in the Languedoc, central government, French national symbol, Fasquis. And I'm going to open this up a little bit more. What the hell? All right. And it says here, the Fasquis symbolize summary of power and jurisdiction. The word is the plural of the Latin word Fasquis, Fasquis, meaning bundle. Traditional Roman Fasquis were bundles of birch rods tied together with a red ribbon to form a cylinder around an axe. Many Western governments have used Fasquis as symbols of power. The Italian fascists took their name from the Fasquis, fa fasci, Fasquis, but the symbolism much greater and Fasquis have avoided much of the stigma associated with 20th century fascism. The Roman fasces look like the ones on the far left with the axe head sticking out of the bundle, but most modern representations show the axe, sometimes double-headed, projecting from the top of the bundle as shown on the right. The picture on the far left is a photography of a Roman tomb, the one next to its Roman reproduction, the least less neatly. Bounds is it to be said. The Fasquis Lectori or bundles of lectors symbolize the Imperium, power, and authority of ancient Rome. Lectors Lectors formed a corpse of apparators, subordinate officials who each carry Fasquis as a symbol of office before a magistrate during the Roman public ceremonies. Rather like modern mace bearers who precede Lord Chancellors, judges, mayors, and university chancellors, the bearers of Fasquis precede other officials, including councils or pro councils. In Rome, heroic soldiers carry Fasquis in triumphal processions. The symbolism of Fasquis was already ancient in even Roman times. Roman historians have recorded that 12 lecturers have accompanied the Estrogen King of Rome, kings of Rome in the distant past. Fasci suggested strength through unity. A bundle of rods bound together possesses more strength than its constituent rods. The rods themselves symbolize the state's power to punish delinquents. Beatings were carried out using birch rods. Sometimes rods taken from the Fasci's 
he actually represented the ultimate power to execute people by decapitating them. It is, has a long history in the ancient Mediterranean countries, Fasquis carried within the limits of the sacred inner city of Rome, generally had their axe blades removed. It signified that the imperium bearing magistrates did not have the additional power of life and death. That power rested within the city with the people through their assemblies. However, during emergencies when the Roman Empire was placed under a dictatorship, dictatura, the electors attending to the dictator retained their axe blades even inside the inner city, a sign that the dictator possessed the ultimate power. The Fasquis in France, once the monarchy had been abolished, the new French Republic needed a new symbol to represent the state and its power, to replace the old royal symbols such as fleur, fleur de lis and the royal crown. Liberty and later, Marinane provided symbols for the revolutionary state, while Fasquis provided an idea symbol to represent the authority of the state is often hidden away in the background. The depiction on the left accompanies the two French decoral flags and the national cipher RF is just visible behind the wreath. The depiction on the right is less hidden, this time by a poster with a new national motto. The axe head is completely concealed by a favoring cap or cap of liberty. And you, can, you, can see, you can see the photos on here on the side as well, so just to let you folks know. All right, and it says below here, it also features prominent of the French seal of state, but their axe has been lost completely and replaced by the spear. Fasquise also appeared on the still unofficial French coat of arms. Still in the background, much prominent, and with no attempt to hide the axe head. Similarly on the representation in the blue to the right where it's scarcely concealed act by all motto of the Republic. So there's some pretty interesting stuff here. You can see it from both ends. And um, there's more photos of the Fasci, or the Fasci, okay? That had it represent France and all that, so. It's really interesting stuff. The Fasquise is one of the greatly, generally recognized symbols of sovereignty, not mentioned in an article to the French Constitution in 1958, which refers only to La Trocol, Troco, Blue, Blanc, Rogue. French flag, as a French flag. La Hine National, the national anthem, the Marasili, and the La Devise de la Republic, motto, Liberté, Allegue, and Fraternité. Okay. And they have one here too, but the Fasquise used in the U.S and elsewhere, and as well as the French examples given above. Fasquies are used today throughout the West. For example, the Spanish Guardia Civil, which is parliamentary police, and by the Norwegian and Swedish police. The symbol is also widely used in the USA, official use of the seal. Senate featured on a pair of cross Fasquies, sealed on the left, as like because of crisscrossing, like a memorial in Washington, D.C. In Washington, Lincoln seats in the Bears, the Fasquise in front of his arms, and there's another one to the U.S. National Guard, and he crosses a peer badge, which I talked about that earlier. And of course here, a freeze in the Fasquise of the Supreme Court, building the picked figure of the Roman centurion holding a Fasquise. To the Fasquise also appears in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the power of the lower house and the country, either on either side of the national flag. And of course, we got here the reverse of the United States Mercury dime. See right design of the Fasquies, a proper Roman style one, and an olive branch. The statue, the statue of Washington on the left side shows him leaning on Fasquies through the top of it, including the axe head is directly covered. And of course, in the far right is a design from an envelope used during the American Civil War, which also featured a Peregrine cap or cap of liberty or liberty pole. So it's interesting about symbols, all right? And this is why I had to present this to look at everything all around. It's how it re what, it, what it represents light or dark. You have to really make that decision. Those are only symbols what can represent because there's even one claim 
on some of the photos. It like has one claim here stating that um, two figures of bundles of sticks to the left and to the right on the wall called Fasquis. They are symbols of Rome's authority over America. Well, anything can happen. It's like part of the whole New World Order ordeal. It doesn't matter if you believe me or not. But the whole thing is, folks, we got to observe responsibly. And how come you don't hear people in Congress talk about these fescues? Okay? But they don't want to go after the Confederate flag or any other symbol, but not these particular things. Like I said, it has its pros and cons. It depends who's holding it. That's what happened with the swastika. It was an ancient symbol, like roughly 3,000 years old, maybe, maybe more. The Third Reich, or the Nazis, made it infamous. So people get offended instantaneously. So this still is just examples of what these symbols are. That's why I, I threw that question out there. And some people say, ah, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Do your homework, this and that. Like I said, I always done my homework, but I always think for the replies too, because it's, it's cool. I always like their comments, but so I like to use name calling. That gets you know, it gets a little bit. Uh, that's like doesn't get the point. So um, I always have to observe responsibly, and that is really it, my friends. Should we need these symbols to represent freedom? Not really, because freedom. Our natural born rights is in us, and we don't need actually these particular symbols to represent that. And that is it, my friends. Thank you for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share this episode and many more, many others within my uh, station throughout your social media network. If you have any questions, comments, recommendations, love letters, hate letters, compliments, criticisms, etc. Please always use it with decor. You hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, Spreaker, and I Heart Radio for your comments. Or you can email me at LokiLuck3, the number three, which is all together, at gmail.com. Once again, I thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves, keep on spreading the love, and may your guardian spirits be with you.